So my name is Idaline Bobe and I'm with the Popular Education Project. Welcome everyone to our Truthful Tuesday teaching, part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Yesterday we took action together in 30 states, claiming our right to health and a healthy planet. Today we're going to deepen our understanding of these issues. We'll start with a moral framing and introduction from one of the national co-chairs of this campaign, Reverend Dr. William Barber. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everybody around the nation. It is good to uh, know that you're all in various teach-ins around the country. Um, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, our uh, the co-chair was in Detroit on yesterday as we were standing with people there uh, who are part of the Poor People's Campaign saying that, as again, we have a right to live fighting for health care and against environmental devastation. Uh, I was in Kentucky uh, with coal miners and who have black lung disease and others I'll talk about in a minute uh, facing environmental devastation and facing a state where the governor now is trying to take away health care for 100,000 people, trying to roll back uh, the, the Affordable Care Act in Kentucky, one of the places where it was working in some powerful ways. So our work is cut out for us, but we are ready as we say forward together. Not one step back. Let me say forward together. Not one step back. And we know that there are five interlocking injustices, the systemic racism, and let me say a minute about racism because of the climate we're in as this teach-in. I think it is very dangerous for us to focus on the words of racism and not focus on the works of racism. We cannot let somebody like what um, Roseanne Barr said be centerpiece in a discussion about systemic racism. Systemic racism is voter suppression, massive voter suppression that is happening in ways we haven't seen since the 20th the uh, 20th century and the civil rights movement. Systemic racism is the refusal to give immigration justice and, and, and proper um, pathways to citizenship and losing 1,500 children. Systemic racism is what's happening to the indigenous native communities and how they are still under the rules of war policies from the 1800s and how their lands are still being poisoned. And if we allow racism to be discussed simply in terms of, of um, uh, words, and we do not get to the works of racism. Re the works of racism is all of the policies, the judges, excuse me, that are being appointed to the federal bench now. Many of them who have been against voter protections. Many of them who are very regressive in their legal theories and thinking. Systemic racism is when you um, know that a policy, whether it be a health policy or a living wage policy, uh, will have a what's called in the law a disparate impact on black, brown, and poor communities. That's what racism is. It's a power term. It is not merely about the words. And I think we in the movement must be careful because right now in the media, they will spend two weeks on the words of racism and not two minutes on the works of racism. And that's why in our movement, when we say racism, systemic racism, we are talking about proven, palpable, real voter suppression and racist gerrymandering. We're talking about unjust immigration laws. We're talking about mass incarceration and the, uh, and the new Jim Crow. We're talking about the continuing injustices in the in, in indigenous communities. That's what we mean when we say racism. When we talk about systemic poverty, we are refusing to use the normal language of the government, 39 million. We are connecting that to the, uh, to, to the other 100 million people who are low wealth, working poor, and poor, th that are mostly white, women, children, and the disabled. When we talk about health care uh, underneath poverty. We're talking about 37 million people not having health care even with the Affordable Care Act. And, and, we, and our country being the only country of the 25 wealthiest countries that does not, that do not offer, that does not offer uh, 
some form of universal health care to all of its citizens. When we talk about ecological devastation, we're talking about land, water, and air. We're not just talking about Flint, even though Flint is in our mind, but we're talking about the, the four million families in this country who have lead in their water all over this country where they can buy unleaded gas in those countries and can't buy unleaded water. We're talking about the way in which the air is poisoned in a place like Duplin County when a multinational country tried to come in with a chicken manure burning plant, claiming that they could burn manure and create electricity, but they didn't tell the people that when you put fire and manure together, it creates airborne arsenic. We talk about war economy. We're talking about the ungodly cost of war. The fact that we pay more in war now, two times more than we did at the height of the Vietnam War. We're talking about the fact that we now spend 53 cents of every discretionary dollar on war and only 15 cents on education and health care. But we're also talking about militarism and imperialism. The fact that the United States now has over 800 bases around the world. We're talking about the fact that since um, World War II, all of the countries we have bombed have been pretty much brown, black, and Muslim countries as forms of militarism. We're talking about the fact that CEOs that make weapons make an average of $19 million a year, while a combat soldier barely makes $30,000, and many of our soldiers have to get on food stamps. When we talk about Christian nationalism as that fifth form of interlocking injustice, we're not talking about whether somebody says, I believe in God. That's easy. The question is, what does your belief in God cause you to do in public policy? That's the question. Anybody can say they believe in God. Anybody can say they have a personal relationship with the divine. But one of my professors taught that if whatever relationship you claim with the divine doesn't produce a quarrel with injustice and a quarrel with inequality and a quarrel with hurting people, then it, it makes your claim terribly suspect, terribly suspect. Uh, the question is not, do you say you love God, but when you pass a policy, does that prove you love people? Well. Particularly the most vulnerable, the poor, the stranger, the sick, the marginalized. Those are the ethical questions as it relates to um, our, our religious values. So whenever we have a religion, religious uh, um, uh, theories, religious propagation that says if you just are against gay people and against abortion and for prayer in the schools and for gun rights and for tax cuts and for America, uh, will you, God bless America and nobody else, uh, that's, not, <laughs> that's not in line with our deepest religious traditions. It's not even in line with our deepest constitutional traditions. And so we are called to challenge that kind of theological malpractice, particularly when that malpractice has, it begins to consecrate injustice and begins to provide a safe space for injustice without critique. When that kind of religion allows religionists to go in and pray P-R-A-Y for politicians while they are praying P-R-E-Y-I-N-G on the poor and the vulnerable, but then we have to raise a moral critique. Now tonight, as we talk about everybody's got a right to live, health care, and environment, I want to frame this in two ways, three ways, excuse me. First, in the, in the Old Testament of the Bible that is recognized by Jews, Muslims, and Christians, one of the earliest names for God, because in the Jewish tradition, they never said God alone. It was always a characteristic of God. They didn't just go around saying God, 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 God. You know, they would say God, our banner, or God, our peace. It was always an attribute of God. They were almost afraid to just say God. And one of the earliest characteristics or descriptions of God is found in the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy. It says God is Jehovah Rapha, healer. Before you can get 
out of the Torah, God is described as being on the side of healing. Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh in Greek, Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. God is a healer. God is against Pharaoh who doesn't heal. Pharaoh who has policies that provide some people health care and other people they don't get it. That's not God. God is Jehovah Rapha. Healer. So all of those who claim all the time so much about God and as I often say, they say so much about what God says so little and so little about what God says so much. How can you claim God and then vote against health care when God is Jehovah Rapha? In the New Testament, if Jesus did anything, he set up free health clinics. In fact, one scripture in, in Matthew says, and he healed them all. All. Not some, not the ones that could afford, but all. In fact, Jesus was often noted to go find people when they were sick and were being left to die by the society of that day and the Caesar-like, Roman-like power structure that said only the 1% really mattered. Jesus would go where someone was sick without health care with an issue of blood. Jesus would find someone who was dying. And, it, and constantly the text says he healed them all. How strange it is that when we hear the battles over health care and we hear the rolling back of health care, we hear all these loud voices when it comes to making sure a baker doesn't have to serve a gay person a cake coming out of the church, certain parts of the church, but then quietness on the issue of health care, but then some claim to follow Jesus. You can't follow Jesus and not be in the business of healing. And um, he never charged a leper a copay. <laughs> he never said to someone, you've got to come back. Where's your card? For Jesus in the New Testament, for God in the Old Testament that's honored by Muslim Jews and Christians, Healing is a human divine right. The third place I want to frame this from is I wish people would stop saying Obamacare. I wish they'd have never named it Obamacare because that was a way of racializing. I wish Obama had said, don't call it that, you know, the Affordable Care Act. And I wish when Democrats had the House and the presidency, they would have gone on and done single-payer health care and been done with this thing and had some guts. Because if they had, they would have been being very Republican. Now, I didn't say extremists, because what we have, we have a lot of extremists who have hijacked the Republican Party. My granddad was a Republican, but he was a Teddy Roosevelt Republican, a Lincoln Republican. And in 1912, it was Teddy Roosevelt who said there were five moral issues that ought to be taken care of in the public square. And two of them were health care and protection of the environment. This is 1912, not 1921. But 1912, not 1972, but 1912. And he set the stage for his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, to come along with Social Security. And why did that happen? Teddy Roosevelt was moved by a movement called the Social Gospel Movement that dared to say there are some policies that should not be an issue of one party or the other. They are fundamental moral rights. He also said a living wage, a basic minimum living wage was a moral issue. Health education, public, was a moral issue. Labor rights was a moral issue. Getting money out of politics, this is 1912. 
Check it out when you can and read the bull, the bull speech that he gave when he broke with both parties. And so I want to say that maybe it's because Franklin Delano Rosa, he never said, he, you know, he said it was a moral right because he knew the Constitution says that we must provide for the common defense. And if you are hurting people environmentally through environmental dev devastation and denying them health care, that is not the common defense. It does not establish justice. It establishes injustice. And it surely is not promoting the general welfare. And so whether it's coal miners in Kentucky or Apaches in Arizona, or whether it's in eastern North Carolina, people fighting against uh, chicken manure burning plants, or whether it's in Flint, Michigan with dirty, nasty water that the authorities knew was dirty and nasty and destructive before they ran it into the city, or whether it's in Alabama where black and white poor people still live with open sewage in their backyards because the politicians and the business communities will not bring the sewage lines to them, or whether it's in Chicago where we're headed in another week, the, the environmental uh, devastation inside of the city of Chicago, whether it's the brother yesterday that spoke in Kentucky who had black lung, who's from Harlan County, one of the 30, uh, one of the 30 poorest counties in this country, or whereas I heard yesterday, Liz, it's about the poison happening right in Louisville, inside of the city of Louisville. Or whether it's the long-term environmental uh, damage that has gone on in New Mexico because of past nuclear testing and the cloud of nuclear radiation, the stuff that just has impacted the Navajo people and so many poor people. Or whether it's the 37 million people that do not have health care even with the Affordable Care Act, or whether it's the states that are now trying to roll back health care and add so-called work requirements, which are nothing but code words to suggest to people that somehow Medicaid expansion is, is giving free stuff to these lazy people, rather than saying that health care ought to be a right, period, mm -hmm. or whether it, it is all the states that, all, that pass voter suppression laws and denied health care. In other words, if, if, if you look at a state and you know that they, did, they didn't expand health care, you can also bet they'll suppress the vote. Flip it over. If you, if you look and find out they support, pass voter suppression law, you'll know that they also, it's almost a, a direct line between those two policies. But wherever it is, we know that it's immoral, it's unjust, it's wrong. And that's why the Poor People's Campaign has a set of did you knows that you'll hear later on tonight, and also a set of demands that you'll hear later on tonight. And that's why we have invited experts here tonight to join us in this Teaching Tuesday, because we want our movement to have depth of understanding so that at every turn, when we put our bodies on the line of civil disobedience, when we protest, when we register people to vote, we can do it from a very deep place because as Dr. King said, people will know, and most of all, we will know, that we have a legitimate discontent. That we're not just doing this because it's a fad. We're not just doing this because it's the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign. We're doing it because we are determined that America will be better, that America has to be better, and that we're not ready to give up yet on the soul and the heart of this country. God bless all of you who are there by, by, by way of live stream. Please hear all of our experts tonight. God bless you. Take care. Hi, my name is Idaline Bobe, once again, and I'm from North Philly. Born and raised. You know the song. You know, y'all know the song. I'm a national educator with the Poplar Education Project, and I am so hyped to say this is our fourth week. Yeah. Fourth week we've been doing this. We said 40 days, and man, it's going through. This week, we're focusing on the right to health and a healthy planet. And this is a very personal topic for someone like me, who was born poor and who suffered from a chronic illness since I was a child. As a child, I was honestly really scared to get sick. I can hear my mom say, girl, you better not get sick. 
Y'all know y'all parents used to be like that. Yeah. And that's honestly because we didn't have health care. So to us, a trip to the emergency room or a doctor's visit could result in homelessness. It could mean us going hungry. It could mean lights out. And it would mean my mom had to pick up another shift, which she already had three part-time jobs. It's sad to say this is the case today with millions of families in the US where nearly half of Americans can't pay a $400 emergency expense. Growing up, I also thought my genetics as a black and Puerto Rican woman, I was just prone to have a lot of diseases. Everybody got them in my family and in my hood. Little did I know that it wasn't genetic, it was due to our environment. The polluted air, poison in our water, living in a food desert where we have no access to clean and fresh food. What type of society poisons their community's water, feeds them dangerous food, pollutes their air, and then denies them of health care? Today, we will hear some facts that I will hope will get you thinking. Because a wise elder in the movement once said, we need to make fighters into thinkers and thinkers into fighters. And that is what our Truthful Tuesdays are all about. As we get started today, I want to start off by giving thanks. Shout out to our camera crew. We see you. Thank you for hooking it up with Facebook Live. To our interpreters. Everyone who organized a watch party today, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone tuning in here, live in person, our many volunteers, and the Festival Center for opening up their doors to us. We have a packed hour of dope information, but before we start, we want to welcome the space with music. And today we're going to introduce Shashida Young. Sashida is the Cultural Arts Director for the DC Coordinating Committee of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and an educator at the Duke Ellington School of the Arts here in DC. She sits on the board of a number of local nonprofits focused on youth and gun violence, and is also a CPR instructor. She's a graduate of Howard Divinity School. We see you, boo with a concentration in ethics and social justice. Please welcome this beautiful soul.
Oh, you do know it. Let me hear it again. No justice. No peace. And one more time. Uh oh. No justice. No peace. Very nice. So I wanted to start with that just because it talks about waking up with certain things on your mind. And when you go through things, and I've been through some things, I may look young, but I've been through a lot too. When you wake up, sometimes it's very hard to stay positive or to keep fighting. Sometimes you do get tired, but your compassion keeps you going, right? Your, your memory of, I want to fight for what's right. Even when you thought about it if you were younger. For me, it was when I was younger. You see, I'm from Washington, D.C. And I was here when it looked like this. It looks beautiful now. A lot of people don't remember it looked beautiful before. Okay? A lot of things happened. I was here doing Reaganomics. I actually didn't get to attend the high school that I wanted to, but I'm teaching there now at Duke County. Right. <laughs> so, I just wanted to share this DC culture with you because one of the reasons I am who I am is really based off of where I'm from. It's based off of always seeing people marching. It's based off of always hearing people singing. It's based off of always seeing people fight for justice, pray for justice, pray for their feet, speak up. And because of that, I don't have that much fear. <laughs> it's weird for me to say because I'm actually pretty shy, but when I stand in front of people, I think about a ministry. What you're doing is a ministry. It is blessing someone you may not even know. It is blessing a plethora of people that needed to be encouraged by you, that needed to hear, oh my goodness, I'm not crazy for what I'm thinking or what I'm researching or what I believe is right. A lot of times we, we hesitate to do that, and so I'm thankful to all of you. Once again, just give yourselves a hand for just being here. The next song I would like to do, oh, that was a weak clap. Let's try it again. Please give yourselves a hand. I see some clouds outside. You could have went somewhere else. <laughs> The next song I wanted to go over um, is We Shall Not Be Moved. We sing it a lot, but I want you to think about those words because sometimes we do get moved, okay? I was redirected to a new location, but my goal was always to come back here. It was always to come back here and fight for the things that I didn't get, to fight for my youth and to be there. A lot of my youth, they're gone now. They are lost from gun violence and drugs and crime. And so what I'm saying today is, think a little bit deeper than yourself. Reverend Barber hit on it. But think a little bit deeper of the effects that it will have for the future. The words we're saying today, besides we shall not be moved, we're also think the people are united. We're also going to do the Hispanic version, okay? I think that you all know this song, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to teach this one, but I just want you to sing it with a passion because sometimes you're gonna be standing in front of people that don't believe you. It happens. And to be honest, sometimes music is the only thing that connects us. That's why we have it. Reverend Barber speaks about it all the time. So, this time I would like for you to stand with me. Like a tree. Like a tree planted by the water. And I want you to clap like thunder. Clap, make that thunder roll. Mean it from your heart. Everybody can do that with me, right? Okay, all right, here we go.
Beautiful music. Fact. There are more than 1,100 coal ash sites throughout the country. Toxins from these sites gradually leach into our water bodies and groundwater or get released in catastrophic spills. Fact. At least four million families with children are being exposed to high levels of lead from drinking water and other sources. Next to speak today is Destiny Watford, a Baltimore native and member of the Free Your Voice group. In 2016, she was the Goldman Environment Prize winner for her work organizing residents in her, in her neighborhood to defeat plans to build the nation's largest trash burning incinerator less than one mile away from her school. Right. Give her a round of applause. Hi. Oh, hi. Hello? Do I make it higher? Hello, okay. Um, my name is Destiny, and I want to do a bit of an experiment with all of you. So I'm going to ask you and those of you who are not here with us to close your eyes. Close them. Um, I want you to imagine a house. This house is one that's been around for literally a decade, maybe more. Its paint is peeling. It has boarded up doors and windows. It used to stand in a community, a community like any other. Open your eyes. This house that you imagined is the last house that ever stood in a community called Fairfield. And its peeling paint and boarded up doors and windows serve as evidence that the space surrounding it was once a community and like the neighborhood it was once a part of, once filled with orchards and trees to climb and waters to swim in, it too has disappeared from existence. Why did this happen? The homes in Fairfield came down after decades of people losing their lives to cancer, of their community, the one that they loved, the one that, the one that they fought for, being replaced by polluting industry in my neighborhood's backyard. So now, in the place of the community that these people once loved, there's the nation's largest medical waste incinerator. There's um, a coal pier with coal higher than uh, uh, what looks like to be mountains in our neighborhood. There is our city's landfill and other, a kaleidoscope, a sea of polluting industries in my neighborhood's backyard. My neighborhood is called Curtis Bay. And in the group that I'm a part of and was a part of when I was in high school, Fear Voice, we learned about Fairfield and learned about the consequence that was made or that happened to people that lived there 
Fairfield was a predominantly black community in South Baltimore. Um, and people that lived there were forced out of their community because of the polluting industry that the city paved way for instead of their health, instead of their neighborhood. And I mentioned Fairfield for two reasons. The first is that their story, as sad as it is, serves as a sort of parable of why it's so important to fight for environmental justice in our neighborhood. But second, the story that I'm about to tell you with my community's fight for environmental justice is a very long one. And that's the saying that like people in my neighborhood has, have been fighting for our right to breathe clean air for generations. So when I was in high school, there was a plan to build the nation's largest trash burning incinerator proposed less than a mile away from my school. And when I first learned about the incinerator, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know what it is. And in case I'm not the only one in the room, um, an incinerator is a, an incinerator burns trash. This one would be producing energy. And it also releases a lot of toxic admissions. So the incinerator that was proposed in my neighborhood would have been, was permitted to release 240 pounds of mercury every year, 1,000 pounds of lead. Um, and this, of course, made us really angry. You know, like we were high school students, we didn't know anything about this project, and now we're learning that it's going to be polluting our air, um, it's gonna be putting our lives on the line, the lives of our friends and our families and our neighbors will be put at risk. And so we came together thinking about how do we fight something like this? The incinerator proposed in our neighborhood would was supported by our governor, who ran for, for a president on a green platform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and our mayor, who supported the development as this holy grail of development. It would, it would, according to them, solve the problem of two crises in Baltimore, the energy crisis and the waste crisis. But that's not true. Um, it would have been putting our lives at risk. The people that live in South Baltimore, that lived um, in this frontline community, in my community, Curtis Bay. And so our challenge was figuring out how do we organize people around this issue? People have been dealing with environmental justice their entire lives, if they lived there, if they went to school there or worked there. Um, and so our big challenge was how do we change this sort of passive acceptance of the way that things are, right? People accepting, I almost cursed, <laughs> accepting um, the bad things that are laid out before them, these toxic developments, and actually believe that we can make change. For us, we used art as a tool and storytelling and, and um, music and poetry and writing to share our story, to share our narrative and saying that like we will not allow this to happen anymore. This is not what we want for the future of our community and we're going to fight for it. Um, and long story short, <laughs> um, five years we fought for our community to stop this incinerator. Um, we were met with a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, challenges, everything from literally seeing the racism in our community coming out to play um, and in our city and the tensions of whose life is valued um, at a very from like just being high school students. But through five years of fighting for our neighborhood with our community, we were able to win that victory. And we won international recognition for our fight. We stopped the incinerator, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And it's really cool that we were able to do that. However, the incinerator isn't the first or last development of its kind, right? So our question, our big question was, if we know that the incinerator isn't the last kind of development that's going to be putting our lives at risk, that doesn't care about the future of our community or 
our children or our children's children, what can we do to make sure that developments like the Insurrector do not happen in our neighborhood? So what we've been doing, and what I'm really excited to share with you about, and a big lesson that we've learned, um, is that we realize that the only way to stop developments that don't care about us is by creating developments in our community, is by having community-driven development, is by literally having people who have been dealing with these environmental injustices, with who have been dealing with decisions being made behind closed doors, um, making the decisions of what happens in our neighborhood. And so um, we've been creating, we are, we are creating a community land trust in our community. Yeah. Um, my time's up, but can I just say one more thing? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're building a community land trust, and that's really significant because for the first time in forever, we're actually making decisions about land in our neighborhood. And that has not been... When it comes to like communities that have been that are poor, that are black, that are brown, that has never been the case, not in our neighborhood. Um, so that's really exciting to share, and I'm happy that I could share some of that with you all. Fact. Since 1998, there have been 5,712 major oil and gas leaks or ruptures on U.S. pipelines. Fact, the Deepwater Horizon BP oil spill accounted for 95% of oil spilled in the past 50 years. Fact, the Department of Defense accounted for more than 70% of U.S. total greenhouse gas emissions in 2016. Fact, when Maria hit Puerto Rico, where the poverty rate was already 43.5%, almost an entire island lost access to electricity. Two months later, more than half of the island's residents still lacked power and about 9% lacked water. Our next speaker, Natalia Cardona, is the Justice and Equity Manager at 350.org. She holds a Master's in International Affairs with a specialization on poverty and developments from the New School in New York. Her work experience spans issues of economic justice, extractive industries, indigenous rights, women's rights, militarism, and peace. Natalia is originally from Guatemala and was forced to immigrate to Canada with her family at the age of 11. Welcome to the stage, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me, and I'm really thankful to the Poor People's Campaign for inviting me. Um, these issues are really important to me because I also grew up in poverty. Um, because of this experience, I really do believe that the climate justice movement has the potential to create system-wide changes that will ripple through existing systems of oppression and break them. As Italine said, I was born in Guatemala and I was a refugee at a really young age, at the age of 11. And that experience has framed my work in climate justice because as climate disasters hit around the world, millions and millions of people are being displaced. And as a young refugee girl, I had a very specific experience. Um, and so did my brothers and sisters. Um, we, along with our single dad, ended up in Canada and also lived in poverty growing up. And despite all the titles that I have, it's been hard work to get that. Um, um, in Canada, we experienced poverty, and I thought it was normal because, hey, we had a single dad who couldn't speak the language and four kids who were under 13. But what I've realized is that that's not necessary. Poverty is not necessary. A few are allowed to hoard the wealth, 
and that's what we need to challenge. That's what should be shame, not yeah. poor people. The other thing that I've grown to learn and know because of many mentors in the movement is that climate change is not a single issue fight. That's why I'm really happy and I was really touched that 350 was an honor that 350 endorsed this campaign because that showed that people in the climate movement and organizations like 350 are willing to say and make those connections. Um, our efforts in this campaign have included our COP leadership joining in nonviolent direct action both here in DC and in Vermont. Um, our local groups across the nations have also mobilized to support this campaign. And we've been encouraged them to do that because we understand that to secure the lasting change that we need, we have to unite across movements for justice and to take the power back that rightfully belongs in the hands of the people. In the past year, communities from California to Puerto Rico have been rocked by fires, floods, and storms. And everywhere, the people already rendered vulnerable by poverty and racism bear the brunt of climate disasters. And in many cases, they're still recovering from that damage. Thousands of Puerto Ricans have been without power for 258 days. We're approaching a year because of Hurricane Maria. And I knew hurricane season started just last week. For low-income communities and communities of color, the disproportionate burden of pollution will only increase. We just heard somebody talk about that. Black people are 75% more likely to live near a toxic oil and gas facilities like refineries. And about 13% of black children have asthma compared to just 7% of white kids. And these locations, these facilities are usually in people of color communities or poor communities. And why is that? Because companies prefer to take advantage of communities with little or no political power. As climate, and I'll say this, I live in, the, in southwest Philadelphia. We live really near a refinery. I have asthma, and my asthma has gotten worse throughout the years that I've lived there. I pray that my daughter won't get asthma, too. As climate change worsens, it's low-income people and people of color who likes the means to protect themselves. 40% of Americans right now say that they don't have enough money to cover an unexpected expense of $400. The cost of preparing and evacuating for a climate disaster it can quickly top that amount. And we've seen that as we've been responding to climate disasters around the country. Climate change is layered on top of other injustice, from unemployment, poverty, racism, militarization, incarceration, increased deportations to the loss of health care. When Harvey happened in Houston, we heard many stories from undocumented people who couldn't even leave their houses because ICE had threatened to deport them. So they were left in flooded homes with children with mold in their homes. We've been working with, with some of those organizations. The global climate crisis has become a multiplier of these injustices. For instance, when Superstore Sandy hit New York City, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers lived in man mandatory evacuation zones, but only 6,800 showed up at emergency shelters. Federal emergency workers soon discovered why. It was because many low-income, elderly, and disabled residents of New York City's public housing complexes were stranded in their dark and cold apartments without heat, backup generators, emergency boilers, or working elevators. The latter prevented many of these residents from descending multiple flights of stairs. And others endured these conditions because they had no other affordable place to stay or no reasonable means of leaving their neighborhoods because mass transit was shut down, among other reasons. In the five years since that happened, the, these communities in the East Coast and many families are still struggling to get back to their, on their feet and to their homes. The most dangerous fossil fuel uh, projects, refineries, pipelines, and more are often built in historically exploited and disenfranchised communities, and often communities of color. The impact on local health, politics, and everyday life is disastrous. So it's no wonder that these communities, from Standing Rock to Southern Louisiana, where the Bayou Bridge Pipeline is going through right now, are also epicenters of resistance and leadership and inspiration for all of us. Their demands for their survival and for the rights of future generations are pushing local, national, and global leaders towards real solutions to the climate crisis. So we must join them. 
This is a call to join these people on the ground and fight for a world that cares for the planet and moves us away from systems of oppressions. That's why this September 8th, we're mobilizing for something called RISE, along with frontline communities in California, to call on world leaders gathering in California for the Global Climate Action Summit to take real action and stand up against the fossil fuel industry and listen to the voices of those who are most impacted. We're calling on those leaders to say no more fossil fuels out of the ground. We want renewable energy and we want jobs for our communities. Because for those of us like me who were born in poverty and are part of the climate movement, the struggle is not just to save the planet. It's to save ourselves from systems of oppressions that allow a few to hoard the wealth while the rest of us struggle to survive. The climate justice movement has a huge amount of potential to have a system-wide effect to not only care for the planet and move our economy away from dirty energy, but also to make sure that fossil-free transition is a just one for workers and communities. Today's fossil fuel economy directs the biggest profits to a small wealthy elite and the biggest disadvantages to the rest of us. Fossil fuel billionaires exploit the poorest and most vulnerable to prop up their destructive business model. Now we need to come together to make sure it's fossil fuel elites, not our communities who bear the cost of this destruction. The dirty energy system is a system of planetary destruction, and its paradigm is racist, it's sexist, it's anti-immigrant, it's imperialist, and it's oppressive. But, alternate, but an alternative world, a renewable energy future, doesn't have to be. As we work towards a just transition, we're envisioning a society where the burdens of the transition, retraining workers, remediating toxic lands, building new infrastructures and technologies, are justly shared across groups. Likewise, a just transition requires that the benefits of transitioning to clean renewable systems, vibrant communities and wild spaces, democratic control of energy production, economic benefits and employment opportunities are shared equitably. It's our hope that this transition will not only move us away from fossil fuels, but also to a more equal society that dismantles systems of oppressions which sustain the dirty fuel economy and the current capitalist system. Thank you. I'm going to say something and I want, it's going to be like call and response. If you could read my shirt, maybe you could repeat it. So when I say fight poverty, you say not the poor. Fight poverty. Not the poor. Fight poverty. Not the poor. Thank you. Fact. There are more than 32 million people who lack health insurance in the United States including 4.6 million black people, 10.2 million Latinx, and 13.6 million white. Fact, medical debt is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. Our next speaker, Charles Van Der Herst, is a professor of medicine and infectious diseases at University of North Carolina. He provided patient care, taught, conducted research in both North Carolina and in Africa. The author of more than 168 papers, he has also written many editorials and columns. Currently, he serves as a volunteer physician at the Free Clinic of Urban Ministries of Wake County and a consultant in global health. He was instrumental in getting the North Carolina Board of Medical Examiners to ban healthcare workers from participating in executions in 2006 and has been arrested twice while committing civil disobedience as part of the Moral Monday Forward Together movement. Welcome him to the stage. Forward together, not, not one step, step back. back. It's great to be here. I'm wearing this white coat representing not just myself, but all healthcare workers, doctors and nurses and physical therapists and social workers and public health people as we join together in the Poor People's Campaign. Because the reason we've, as a, we've done this in North Carolina, for the first time in North Carolina history, history we threw out an incumbent governor. We inc threw out 
Republicans, while everyone else, uh, other states, were losing uh, Democratic seats. And we did that because we came together with all groups. It's not just environmental issues. It's not just health issues. It's not re reproduct just reproductive rights. It's just not, uh, not just immigrants' rights, LGBTQ. It's all together coming to fight this. Okay, so the right to health care is closely linked to the right to the healthy environment. Toxic waste, polluted air, lead contaminated water, Agent X in North Carolina, an entire city in Wilmington, North Carolina can't drink their water because of uh, DuPont Kimor is polluting it. Global warming has increased the spread of mosquito-borne illnesses, my specialty in the United States. We're seeing malaria for the first time in 50 years. The good thing about that is, of course, is mosquitoes don't give a crap about whether you're wealthy or poor. They bite everybody. So something's going to be done about that soon. <laughs> Healthcare is closely related to systemic racism and poverty. You've heard some of it. We know well-known statistics about the lack of access to care, higher morbidity and mortality among African Americans in the US. I see that every day in my clinic. There's a higher mortality among the poor, less access to care, particularly in states that did not expand Medicaid. I'm going to tell you about two patients. 28-year-old African American man works at a fast food restaurant. He's paying taxes. His taxes are paying for my Medicare, my health insurance. He himself does not have health insurance. He uh, has type 1 diabetes. He got it as a child. He's half blind, half renal failure, because, of course, he doesn't have health insurance. So it's not just a moral issue that it's bad. It's not just racism, because this is an African-American guy. But it's stupid economically, because he'll go on dialysis, which will cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. So he'll go from a tax-paying citizen to someone who's on welfare. I'll tell you about a woman who was working um, had health insurance during the 2008 economic downturn. She um, lost her job, lost her insurance, and she felt a lump in her breast. Unfortunately, she developed metastatic breast cancer. It's a tragedy and an economic waste. Why was the Affordable Care Act passed in the first place? It's because health care costs in the United States, as a percentage of our gross domestic product, were rising faster than the gross domestic product for decades, 10 to 12 percent per year. It was bankrupting our businesses. Um, it was bankrupting our people. Yet our health care was worse, our outcomes was worse than other countries that are spending far less. So we had to pass the Affordable Care Act to bring our health care costs under, thing and under control and to help so many more Americans. What the ACA did, it said no pre-existing conditions. It said no lifetime cap for expenses. It was portable. You could move from job to job. It had 10 prevention tests and care for free. It covered a parity of equal coverage for mental and medical illness and for uh, helping with the opioid epidemic. And it covered the working poor earning less than 133% of the federal poverty level. And it provided funding for research on the best practices. Who has and does not have insurance in the United States? Well, you heard that, um, that who does not, the over 30 million do not have it. So we're the, among the, the largest world economic power, and we're the only one that doesn't have universal health care. 75% of people in nursing homes, that's white, black, Hispanic, and everything, are on Medicaid. Okay, So they need their health, and that's what's keeping them alive and comfortable. So who expanded Medicaid? 17 states in the United States expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Those 17 states run by Republicans, OK? Another 15 controlled by Democrats and one by independent. 17 states have not expanded Medicaid, OK? The first three years of expanding Medicaid would be paid by the federal government. And it then drops down, but never goes below 90% of the cost being borne. So the cost to the states is not much, but the benefit to the states are enormous. Okay? We now have a natural experiment, because we have all those states that expanded versus those that did not. So we can see what happens. Well, there's increased death rate in the states that didn't expand Medicaid. For every million people, Without Medicaid expansion, 2,000 die, okay? So there's 30 million 
without health insurance, that's 60,000 deaths, unnecessary deaths, usually due to a delay in seeking treatment until it's too late, and lack of preventative care like mammograms, pap smears, blood pressure screening. There's increased morbidity, as I told you, so you may not die, but then you become incapacitated so you can't work. Without health insurance, families become bankrupt. They lose their homes they, because to pay for their bills. Rural hospitals drown in debt. In North Carolina alone, we've had four rural hospitals that have had to close because we didn't expand Medicaid. Now, that's another sort of good thing because rich people need hospitals too. And if you have a heart attack or a stroke and you need to get to the nearest hospital, but the nearest hospital is three hours away, you're out of luck. Insurance premiums are higher in the states that didn't expand Medicaid for those who do have insurance. Now, I want to define some things. Universal health care means that everybody, 100%, have health insurance. 19 countries in the world have that. We do not. Four have 98% coverage. What's single payer? Single payer is with one entity who's paying for all the health care, OK? In the US, we have two very good examples. The Medicare system, that's a single payer system. It pays for 53 million Americans get health insurance through that, single payer. The VA is the other example. 15 million, uh, 15 million veterans and current military get their health care through the VA. That's single payer. Um, Medicaid is technically not single payer because it's paid by both the states and the federal government. Now, what's socialized medicine, that evil term? Well, the VA, is socialized medicine is when the actual government entity runs the health system itself. It provides the doctors and nurses and the hospitals and the nursing home. Well, the VA, Veterans Administration, is socialized medicine, as is the English system. Okay? So 15 million people get their health care in the United States through a socialized medicine system. So why should we have single payer? Well, the biggest reason is all those middlemen, okay, all those insurance agents, all those CEOs, all those people doing paperwork, that is $500 billion a year going for paperwork that would disappear if we went to single uh, pair. It also allows us to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry. That's another $113 billion a year that we could negotiate with lower uh, health care prices and generic um, drugs. So if we expand health care to all in single payer, we would add 30 million people on, on get insurance. We'd have lower mortality, lower costs due to prevention, lower premiums. It'll eliminate the middleman. It allows us to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry, less burden on businesses, and it's a moral and right thing to do. Right now, we're balancing the budget on the backs of the working poor. Okay, that is immoral. They've given me, a wealthy physician, a huge tax cut in North Carolina and the federal government at the expense of my patients. That's not right. Thank you. Fact. U.S. spends more per capita on health care than any other country at approximately $10,348 per person per year. Fact. In 2016, 43% of adults with health insurance struggled to pay their deductibles. Nearly 30% had a hard time affording medical bills, and 73% cut back on basic household needs and food to pay their medical bills. Fact, 10,002 people died while waiting for a judge's decision about their disability benefits application in 2017. Our next speaker. Nizmi Zarenko is a lifelong Pennsylvanian. She is co-founder of Put People's First PA, a statewide grassroots human rights organization, which is a current 
which is currently leading a campaign for healthcare as a human right. She is also a co-chair of the Pennsylvania State Coordinating Committee for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Welcome her to the stage. Hi everybody, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank the folks who organized uh, Truthful Tuesdays, uh, all the national organizers of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, uh, the Popular Education Project, um, the Festival Center, is that the name of this building? Um, and my other amazing presenters, um, Dr. Charles and Destiny, um, and Idaleen, and Natalia. Uh, I want to shout out United Workers, because that's Destiny's group, Free Your Voice, is with United Workers. Shout out to United Workers in Baltimore. Check them out. The housing organizing landscape around this country is extremely bleak, and United Workers is doing some of the best work in this country. Um, so I come to you today not as a healthcare expert uh, by any means. Um, I am an expert in my own experience as someone who needs healthcare, who struggles to pay for healthcare, um, as a healer and as an organizer. Um, so put people first PA, um, shout out to Pennsylvania. Um, as Yudaline said, as a, as a grassroots statewide organization uh, fighting for health care as a human right and a public good. So when I say health care, y'all are going to say human right, okay? Health care? Human right. Health care? Human right. Health care? Human right. Thank you. So that's one of the basic things that we need to organize around. Oh, oh man, my water just went away. Water is a human right, man. Um, so. One of the basic things we need to organize around is this idea that our basic needs are our human rights, right? And that's how we define it in Pennsylvania. Our basic needs are our human rights. And more and more, right, as we are working more and more jobs, um, you know, I don't have health care provided to me through my jobs. We're working more and more jobs. We're making less and less money. And all the things that we need to survive are more and more expensive. And if we see all those things as commodities, as things that we need to buy and purchase, then we're really, um, we don't have a future, right? There's no future for us, there's no future for our families. And so our basic needs really need to become our human rights. That's one of our basic um, groundings in Put People First. So I wanna share a couple of things uh, with you from Pennsylvania. So just like there's an audit, the souls of poor folk, um, on the national level, we've been doing a Pennsylvania audit for every week of the campaign around that theme, which has been really amazing with folks from our political education team. And so Pennsylvanians are more likely to die from many things uh, compared to other states in the nation, heart disease, drug-related deaths, cancer, and it's actually the Appalachian areas of Pennsylvania. I grew up in Westmoreland County, which is part of that section. It's a section in the middle of the state in the mountainous regions and going into the southwest that goes kind of down to West Virginia. Um, those communities are the hardest hit. So when Reverend Barber talks about how Jesus went into the places, he went to find the people that were sick. He went to find the people that no one else wanted to deal with, that no one else wanted to connect with. And that's what we do in Put People First PA. We go to the places where no one else wants to organize. We go to the places that are overlooked by the political parties. We go to the places that, you know, where people have been written off, where they say, oh yeah, well, Pennsylvania is Philly and Pittsburgh and Alabama in between. And we know what that means. It means you don't go there, right? Because there's no one worth anything there. So we have to go in those places, right? So we go to those places. Death from diabetes is 28% higher in Appalachia. 700,000 people in Pennsylvania are without insurance. But we already know that just because you have insurance doesn't mean you have care, right? Coverage is not the same as care. 
deductibles, co-pays, our whole healthcare system is a patchwork system and they try to make us think that the different parts of our body are sort of separate entities, right? If you think about that, it's very silly, right? So our health care is different than our dental care, it's different than our mental health care, it's different than our reproductive care, right? It's different than gender-related care. No, those things are all part of one system, and we need one system that covers all of those things. Um, so I want to talk, three minutes left, wow, time just really blows by. So um, I want to talk about health care um, as a way, as a lens that allows us to see the four evils that we're talking about in the Poor People's Campaign, right? So through health care, we can understand systemic racism with the infant mortality rates of, of black women and children. Through health care, we can understand poverty, right? There's a different standard of care for folks who are on Medicaid in Pennsylvania, where if you go and you need a root canal, you can't get it paid for. You're going to get an extraction. You're going to get your teeth pulled. Um, through healthcare, we can understand um, environmental devastation. So Richard from Pennsylvania spoke at our action yesterday about having been incarcerated inside a prison that was sitting on top of a coal ash dump getting sick, dropping from 225 pounds to 170 pounds, and keeping a letter in his pocket in case he was found dead to give to his family. He's one of our members. And um, that prison is SCI Fayette, State Correctional Institution Fayette, and we're fighting for justice for the folks incarcerated there and also the surrounding community. Um, and through um, you know, through, we can see it through the war economy, right? We can see what's going on with the VA system, right? Trying to privatize that system. So healthcare is a lens through which we can understand all these evils. Also the distorted moral narrative, right? If you're sick, it's your fault. You didn't do the right things. You made the wrong choices. You didn't eat the right food. You don't live in the right place. You didn't get the right job, right? It's your fault, right? That's a lie. So, um, but the other thing that we can do through healthcare is that we can build this new and unsettling force, right? Because everyone has a body, everyone is impacted by it, and so what we've seen in Pennsylvania and we've seen in other places, we've learned from Vermont and Maine and other places that have healthcare as human rights campaigns is that it's something that can bring us together, right? Healthcare can bring us together. We're all impacted by it differently, but we are all impacted by it. Whether we live in a rural area, whether we live in a city, a town, no matter what gender we are, no matter what race we are, no matter what age we are. And so healthcare is also an organizing principle, and that's why we chose it and put people first, because we wanted something that would allow us to unite our class, because that's the, what, that's the work that we have to do, right, in the Poor People's Campaign. And so healthcare is something that allows us to do that. It actually is um, a methodology. Organizing around healthcare as a human right is a methodology for being able to do this work of building the new and unsettling force and uniting the poor. There's my time. Um, so I wanna just say, just thank you so much uh, for having us. Um, we've been building this nonviolent Medicaid army uh, modeled after the nonviolent army of the poor. Check us out, www.putpeoplefirstpa.org. Thank you so much. Nijmi is an amazing, amazing leader. So if you haven't followed her on Facebook too, she gives like daily, daily drops gems and knowledge on Facebook, on Twitter, on all of that. So follow her. Today, there was a lot of information that we shared. And why we're sharing this, again, the easiest sentence that I can wrap up why these Tuesdays are so important is that we want to make thinkers into fighters, fighters into thinkers. We all need to be doing this together. The truth is that our policies have not fundamentally valued human life or the ecological systems in which we live. Instead, it has prioritized private, corporate, and financial interests over our precious natural resources. We have a fundamental right to clean water 
air, and a healthy environment and public resources to monitor, penalize, and reverse the polluting impacts of fossil fuels industries. Everybody has the right to live. Say that with me. Everybody has the right to live. The U.S. Constitution was established to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. 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 Given the abundance that exists in this country and the fundamental dignity inherent to all humanity, every person in the United States has the right to dignified jobs and living wages, housing, education, health care, welfare, and the right to organize for the realization of these rights. Knowing this, we, the Poor People's Campaign, a call for, what is our thing? A national call for moral revival. We demand 100% clean, renewable energy and a public jobs program to transition to a green economy that will put millions of people in sustainable living wage jobs. We demand a fully funded public water and sanitation infrastructure that keeps these utilities and services under public control and that prioritize poor, rural, and native communities that have been harmed by polluting and extractive industries. We demand a ban on fracking, mountaintop removal coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines, refineries, and coal, oil, and gas export terminals. We demand the protection of public lands and the immediate cessation of opening up public lands for polluting and extractive industries. We demand fully funded public resources and access to mental health professionals and addiction and recovery programs. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state and the protection of Medicare and single payer universal health care for all. We demand equal treatment and accessible housing, health care, public transportation, adequate income, and services for people with disabilities. We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law and the reinvestment of those funds into public programs for housing, health care, education, jobs, infrastructure, and welfare for the poor. We demand a budget that promotes the general welfare. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Please get involved with the campaign at the poorpeoplescampaign.org. Please sign our online pledge card and get involved with a state in the city near you. Thank you so much. <laughs> to close us out, we're going to have our sister, Shashita Young. Thank you. All right, y'all. So you know I know how to play piano already, but I want to do this acapella. I actually learned this acapella. I want to give a shout out to Virginia State University at HBCU, where I sung this first. And a shout out to the AME Church in Franklin County, Virginia. All right. The song is easy. You actually know this song. It's called Wade in the Water. I want to spend just my one minute. I don't have my timekeeper, but I wanted to spend my one minute explaining what that Wade in the Water is about. Being a theomusicologist, I just want to point out I got my undergrad from Virginia State for music. But something I learned at Divinity School really connected with me. And it dealt with the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation was written by a bunch of lyricists. They were speaking in code. And most of the time, they were speaking about social justice issues. A lot of times, we make a lot of hoopla and focus on threats and things of that nature. But it was spoken in code for purpose to spread the message and to not get killed, to make sure the message was still heard, to create songs, to create these movements, these experiences, to connect us intergenerationally to where we are today. The song Wade in the Water is no different. It deals with the biblical side. Most of the time when 
persons enslaved talk about something dealing where they are not in control, they relate it to a Moses effect, where they're trying to get out of Egypt. We're trying to get out of Egypt. <laughs> we are trying to get in the promised land. Yeah. Our promised land was just said to you out loud. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to think about that. And I changed the words around a little bit, but you'll hear it in the verse. Um, Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Sing with me. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water. Now listen. See that man all dressed in white. God's a gonna trouble the water. He just keeps on telling lies. God's a gonna trouble the water. Sing with me, wait in the water. Oh, wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's a gonna trouble the water. Here's another one. See that band all dressed in red. God's a gonna trouble the water. It looks like the band that Martin led. God's a gonna trouble the water. Yes. Sing with me, wait in the water, oh, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's a gonna trouble the water. This one's from Yara. Here we go. Wait in the White House. Wait in the White House, children. Wait in the White House. God's a gonna trouble. The White House. The White House. One more. Wait in the Congress. Wait in the Congress, children. Wait in the Congress. God's a gonna trouble the con. Back water. Wait in the water. Oh, wait in the water, children. Wait. the last one I want to do. It goes like this. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. I will live for liberation because I know why I was made. Sing with me, say, I am not afraid. I am not afraid, I will live for liberation, cause I know why I'm... Sing it from your heart now. I am not afraid, oh, I am not afraid, I will live for liberation, cause I know why I'm... Last one, sing with everything. I am not afraid. Sing with power. I am not afraid. I will live for liberation. Cause I know why 